Welcome back. So here's the deal. At least in the residency programs I'm familiar with, we do not train our emergency medicine residents well to actually be the trauma team leader and run a trauma, which is ridiculous because the general surgeons basically have no need to learn this information. Either they'll be in a community place where they won't come in until 20 minutes after the trauma begins, or they'll be at a level one trauma center where the trauma attending should have gone under a trauma fellowship and therefore we'll learn this stuff then. So it should be the EM folks who are learning this, not the gen surge residents, but at most places I find that is not the case. And the beautiful thing about being a trauma team leader as opposed to a medical code or resuscitation is it's a bounded realm. There's really a limited number of things that you could do during the resuscitative phase. And if you just know all your options, you'll be able to much more easily decide what is and isn't the right thing to do. So my buddy Chris Hicks and I, we designed this taxonomy of all the things a trauma team leader needs to know. Now we're going to go through them step by step. You can't read this in its tiny form in the slide. Don't worry, we're going to go one by one. But here's the thing. In the areas you're going to see that are blue, they are cognitive steps. In areas that are red, they are actual actions. If they're dotted red, it means, or dotted blue rather, both, it means that you will sometimes do it. And if they're solid lines, it means you will always do it. So we're going to go through these one by one. And I think you'll begin to understand what I mean when I say it's a bounded realm within the skills for a trauma team leader. All right, let's talk about the things the trauma team leader needs to consider within themselves. They could do a zero point survey, which is a way of actually taking the team before the patient arrives, before the primary survey, the zero point survey, and make sure everyone's safe, everyone knows each other, that all the equipment that may be needed is there, that everyone's in the right space, and that you really group together and actually form a de novo team that may not have been there prior to the zero point survey. All right, where does the trauma team leader stand? They stand at the foot of the bed where they can control the room. They're not involved in the procedures. They're not involved in things going on in the head of the bed. You need a separate team for that. That's how this differs from ATLS, which is made for one doc and one nurse in some rural environment. That's not how it is in academic trauma centers. There's always extra help around. And as such, you should stay out of the fray. You keep a calm and quiet environment and you use closed loop communication and you encourage it throughout the code. And then you do sit reps, recaps throughout the trauma arrest or resuscitation where you say, hey, here's what's going on now. Does anyone have any ideas, any other thoughts, anything we could be doing differently right now? And then if you need to get involved in the procedure, you need to assign someone else to take over that role of 360 degree awareness. We call this eyes on, eyes off. All right. Now you have a partner in crime here. It's the podium nurse and she or he will be your really your partner in this throughout. And here's the things they'll do. They should run a pre-brief on all the things that are going to be needed. We have a checklist for this. We don't have enough time for me to go through it, but the nurses run this pre-brief checklist before we start. They shouldn't be announcing the time every five minutes to allow us to retain cognitive awareness of how long we've been doing this resuscitation. If there's a task that needs doing or a piece of equipment, they're the one point that everyone in the room could ask for that thing that they need as opposed to having to figure it out in real time. Oh, I think John could get me this or Connie could do this. No, you just address it all to one person and they assign the roles, all right? If the trauma team leader, their role becomes ambiguous, they go to work on a procedure, the podium nurse is empowered to bring them back and say, someone needs to be running this trauma. All right, they're in charge in our place for a finger stick and tetanus. So the docs don't worry about it. It's the podium nurse's job. And then if there's an open fracture uh, or a dirty chest tube, they ask for what antibiotics do you want? All right, now the least important thing they're also doing is filling out the trauma sheet, which I think is a complete waste of time. And we give far too much role to that as opposed to all the other things on this list. All right, situational control. The trauma team leader is always maintaining the room in a state of quiet, potential to get things done. You cannot actually have a loud room, whether it's from the patient or the team. So they're keeping themselves quiet. They're keeping the team quiet. They're keeping the patient quiet. They're keeping the room quiet, which means sometimes you have to use disassociative ketamine to keep agitated patients with head injury or intoxication from ruining that environment of quiet and control. Sometimes you actually intubate for this, especially if the patient's just wailing in pain from a dislocation, an open fracture. The, the, sometimes the way to handle that is just to intubate the patient and then get they're going to go to the OR. They're going to need to be intubated anyway. And then they're, it's under control. And then crowd management, kicking out all the extraneous people in the room. 
All right, let's talk about the primary survey, most of this, but you might not have seen this. X used to be called CABC, and that C is for major hemorrhage, but that's confusing. What's the extra C? I don't know. I don't remember. It's X for exsanguination. So exsanguination is the patient protecting their airway. What is their respiratory status? How do their extremities feel? Are they cold? Up, worried about hypovolemic shock, worried that they're bleeding out. Are they warm? That's weird because they're hypotensive. Is this spinal shock, neurogenic shock? What's the character of the radial pulse? That tells you a lot about whether they need a blood transfusion. If you could feel a strong radial pulse, they don't, regardless of what their blood pressure is. And if you can't, they probably do. And then a quick check. Is the bleeding from the abdomen? Is the abdomen swelling? Is the bleeding from the pelvis? Is there obvious fracture going on? D, disability. Get your neuro exam now. This may be the last time you're going to do it. If you're going to intubate this patient and the neurosurge comes down and it's like, what though is their neuro exam? You'll be like, bah, 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 bah. no, you look like a fool. Get it now when you actually could still ascertain it. And then E for environmental, keep that patient warm. All right. Advanced airway. Not every trauma needs it, but if they do, that's why it's dotted lines, then you're going to use a dump kit, which means all of the items on a table in front of you, not stuck on the patient's chest, they fall on the floor. You're going to demand as the trauma team leader that the airway people, because you're not going to be doing the airway, you're just supervising the trauma, not the supervising the airway. It's a team of teams. You have a sub team for the airway, but you're going to demand they use a checklist. You're going to suggest, should this be awake? Should this be a delayed sequence intubation, depending on the situation going on with the patient? And then you're going to make sure they limit it to three attempts. And then you're going to mentally prepare yourself for a crike if that airway team, that sub team is not able to do it themselves. This is one area where if you're the best person in the room as the most experienced trauma person, you might have to break away from the trauma team leader role to do a cricothrotomy. All right. Monitoring. Saturation. We know it. EP. Make sure if you're using non-invasive that the rep time is set to something like two minutes, not 60 minutes, not 30 minutes. End tidal CO2 even for non-intubated patients, becomes a marker of shock. Huge, beneficial to have. Low end tidal in a patient who's spontaneously breathing means shock state in trauma. Consider an art line early. Consider a core art line in the groin, not in the wrist for patients who are really sick. And then consider monitoring temperature with something like a temperature Foley if you have that available. All right. Now, if the patient's hypotensive or showing signs of malperfusion, you're going to find the shock which means look at the end tidal CO2, that's a hint. Look at the rapid assessment for bleeding for trauma, that's a hint. All of these things along with blood pressure will tell you they're bleeding somewhere, you're gonna find that site. You're gonna look at the five sites, right? These, thorax, abdomen, retroperitoneum, which includes the pelvis, femur or thigh, and then the street, the environment. So they're exsanguinating out into the environment. Those are the five sites. You're going to look for rapid assessment of the abdominal cavity with either EFAST or a diagnostic peritoneal lavage. You're going to ask yourself, could they be bleeding to the thorax? You could assess that with chest x-ray, pelvic x-ray. It will tell you if they're bleeding into the pelvis or give you a hint to it. Your EFAST is also going to tell you, could this be a pericardial tamponade or a tension pneumothorax? And then if you don't find it in any of those places, is this neurogenic shock from the spine or is it a medical cause of arrest causing that hypotension? All right. If the patient needs chest decompression because they're about to crash and therefore you want to take the chest out or you've actually confirmed there's an injury there, then you're going to ask your podium nurse for your drainage setup, your Pluravac. You're going to ask for a fast finger and a slow plastic, which means you're going to do a finger thoracostomy. You're going to make your slice, hemostat, and then a finger in, and that should take less than 20 seconds. And then they can take all the time in the world to actually put in the chest tube. So fast finger, slow plastic. And then you as a trauma team leader are going to break away, put on a sterile glove and touch the lung yourself to make sure you could actually rule that thorax out unless you really trust the people who are doing that procedure. All right. Access. Minimum for me, two 18-gauge IVs. But if they're sick, I want either a rapid infusion catheter, a introducer, or an HD catheter. Last ditch is IO. It'll get you through the intubation and like maybe you could slam some blood in for the first couple minutes, but then you need something bigger. You need either central access or a big peripheral line. All right. If they need blood, you sign a blood sub team and you consider TXA. You use a commercial transfusing device, both for rapidity and for warming. No bungs, none of those little things that you could screw a line into. Those steal all of the flow or they're called caps, they're called what have you. They're those things that allow you to actually put a lure in directly and turn. Those kill flow. They need to be direct, either IV to blood connection, the blood set, or if there's something interposed, it needs to have none of those bungs there. You shoot for one-to-one. You consider concentrates. 
like prothrombin complex concentrated, especially if the patient's on Coumadin or they're a liver patient. You could be guided by viscoelastic testing if you have it available, and you consider early cryoprecipitate or fibrinogen. And then you see there calcium. We underestimated how much calcium these patients need. For me, every two units, they get a gram of calcium chloride. All right. If they need an art line, then you ask for a setup, common femoral in any sick trauma patient, and you must use ultrasound. All right. Sedation. You're trying to balance sedation and BP. You want them to lose some of their peripheral vasoconstriction to allow organ perfusion, and yet you don't want them to bottom out their blood pressure. So you're shooting for a map between 50 and 65, and you're going for a high flow, low pressure state, which means that you want the patient to have good cardiac output, but keeping the pressure low so you don't knock off the clot. Not so much right now. What am I going to do? I'm going to give blood products until the pressure gets above 65, and then I'll trickle in some fentanyl to sedate the patient, not in its early phases, but as you get higher and higher, fentanyl becomes a sedative agent. You, if you don't like that, you can consider ketamine. But once you get to the 500 microgram dosing of fentanyl, you actually get wonderful sedative effects. And that's actually how I handle my trauma. If they're moving around too much and you've sedated them, then consider paralysis. All right, labs, you know all this. I'm not going to go through it. If you have Teg and Rotem, bring it in and send a fibrinogen. All right, if they're a pelvis or femur patient, then you want to stabilize that. A binder if they're a sick pelvic patient or a femur splint if it's a femur fracture. If you don't have that, bring the femur to length and then just let them sit on the bed. Zone three Reboa for either of those injuries can be a temporizing measure. All right, brain preservation. At this stage, we're still pushing the map in these patients. So bring your map goal up to 80. Keep your PaCO2 35 to 40. Consider early osmotics, but not mannitol, which will drop their blood pressure, but things like hypertonic saline that will both increase their cardiac output and lower their ICP, and then maintain good stats throughout the entire code. Secondary survey, a rapid search for injury. Make sure you check the extremity pulses, not just for presence, but for equality between the sides. No need for a log roll. It's garbage. You're going to get the CT of the spine. No need for rectal exam. You're going to actually find all the injuries you need to with your abdominal CT or in the OR. And avoid definitely pushing on that spine. This is all just dumb remnants, and ATOS now agrees. Imaging decisions. All right. Now, most of these sick trauma patients are going to get a PAN scan, but consider the add-ons. I'm not going to go through them one by one. You could actually check the lecture out on MCRIT, but always consider what else can I get? Do they need a CT cystogram if they have a pelvic fracture? Do they need facial cuts so you don't have to take the trip back to CT? All right. When and where to go. Consider the benefits of early OR versus the need to stabilize in the recess room so they don't die in the elevator. Your destinations are the CT scan the, or the IR suite, and that's really dependent on what's going on with the patient. It should be a 30-minute timer the second you have a cross clamp on the aorta or you've placed up a Reboa. And then we have a leave the room checklist that we run as we're leaving the room so we don't forget things like bringing extra blood products, did the patient actually get their antibiotics, etc. All right. So that was a whirlwind tour of the labors of a trauma team leader. If you want this taken in more detail, then just come on over to MCRIT, and I have a lecture that will take you step-by-step step in much more detail for each of those, and that is mcrit.org 278. All right, we should be running our own traumas. We should be handling this in a learning capacity, not the general surgeons, and it's not hard to do, but you need practice, and if you've been out and you came from a residency program where no one really taught you how to do this right, and you're a new attending, hopefully this lecture will help you. If you have questions about it, then I am so happy to talk about these things. Just hit me up on Twitter, at MCRIT. All right, I will speak to you very soon at the Q&A.